Foi lá que o fai A weakening desire Burn our hearts with truth All the ones we're here We see a seat real quick. If you did not grab one of our bulletins uh, and you're interested in going to grab one, we do have them out in the lobby. Uh, If you have them, I'm just going straight out from the source of our announcements today. So first things first, this Sunday, uh, right after the service, we have the women's ministry luncheon. If you're a lady and you'd like to get plugged into the women's ministry, they're going to do a lunch right over here through those double doors into the fellowship hall, you're not going to want to miss it because you'll also get an insight into all of the other stuff uh, coming up that the ministry is going to be doing, including, my guess is, the retreat and and some of those other really fun activities, uh, opportunities for you guys. Uh, The second thing, this Saturday at 8 a.m., also in the fellowship hall, we have the Band of Brothers breakfast. Uh, If you're a man and you want to get plugged into a group of men who likes to eat hearty breakfasts, and uh, wants to fellowship together and be encouraged, right? Then Saturday morning, once a month, I believe it's the first Saturday, or second, second Saturday of the month, my apologies. Um, we want to have you guys come join us for those Band of Brothers breakfasts. That's a mouthful. Okay. So, and then lastly, uh, with Marcy Mitchell somewhere in here, I'm sure, uh, Aspire, if you are interested or know somebody who might benefit from the positive parenting classes, 
The first one is taking place uh, March 5th, that's this Tuesday, at Aspire, uh, and it's all about how to care for your kids, how to respond as a parent, instead, like, instead of reacting to what your kid does, which I tend to do sometimes, it's I'm reacting, I'm not, you know, planning it out in advance and loving them well sometimes, you know, I'm a dad, I'm a little impatient sometimes. Parenting does that to you, amen? <laughs> yeah. You, you, I thought I was a really patient man, and then I had kids, and I'm like, wow, I am not as patient as I thought I was. So if you are interested or know somebody who might benefit from those positive, positive parenting classes, uh, please get them plugged in with Marcy Mitchell, and uh, we'd love to go from there. All right. Hey, you guys are done with me. That's great, right? Uh, let's take a minute real quick to stand up, to meet and greet those around us, to get to know somebody new, and uh, make someone feel welcome. Thanks. All righty, folks, you can remain standing, but find your seats. My name is Bart. I'm the worship leader here at Centerpoint Church. We want to give a big shout out to all you visitors and just say welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, we like to start our services with a prayer uh, to get our hearts centered on the Lord before we start worship. So if you would, just bow with me now and let's pray. Father God, we are here for you today. Lord, we want to celebrate you and celebrate your son and what he's done. Help us to focus on you this morning, Lord, to glorify you in our worship. Through your Holy Spirit, may you move in and through us, Lord. May we let go of any problems or challenges or a hungry stomach, whatever may be trying to distract us from focusing in on just a wonderful time of worship with you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. There will be a time when the sun will rise Any other day then will come like a thief in the night this is what I'm longing for In that time of us human to bring Into death and pain and suffering Oh, this is what I'm longing for So I set my eyes on the ways of the risen Lord all my days I will follow him with something in my heart cries. I thirst for so much more. My soul oh, my soul oh, my soul oh.
voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. How I long to breathe the air of heaven The pain is gone and mercy fills the streets To look upon the one who bled to save me And walk with him for all eternity There will be a day when long about for him. There will be a day when death will be no more. Standing face to face with him who died and rose again. Holy, holy is the Inspiration, songs of faith we sing through doubt and fear. And in the end, we'll see that it was worth it when He returns to wipe away our tears. Oh, there will be a day. When all will bow before Him There will be a day When death will be no more Standing face to face With Him died and rose again Holy, holy is the Lord And on that day Join the resurrection and stand beside the heroes of the faith. And with one voice, a thousand generations sing, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Sing with me. And on that day, we join the resurrection. Stand beside the heroes of the faith And with one voice a thousand generations Sing worthy is the Lamb who was slain
I've carried a burden for too long a while. I wasn't created to bear it I hear your invitation to let it all go. Yeah, I see it now, I'm laying it down, and I know that I need you. I run to the Father, I fall into grace. I'm done with the hiding, there's reasons to wait. My heart needs a surgeon, my soul needs a friend. So I run to the Father again and again and again and again. Oh, oh, oh. You saw my condition. I came from the start. Your son for redemption Christ for my heart and I don't have context For that kind of love I don't understand I can't comprehend it All I know is Surgeon, my soul needs a friend, so I run to the Father again and again and again and again.
small child of weakness watch and pray find in me thine all in all Jesus paid it all all to him I owe sin had left a crimson stain he washed it white as snow By thy grace to claim, I'll wash my garments white in the blood of Calvary's lamb. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. Stand in him complete. Jesus died my soul to save. My lips shall still repeat. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Thank you, worship team. Weren't the lyrics to those songs amazing? Did you see yourself in any of those? Identify with the incredible reminders. Maybe if you can't remember any other one that he changed your name from lost to saved. Hey, thank you for being with us this morning. It is our privilege to count you as part of the family this morning. I know that we all come to this place every week. Sometimes it turns into more of a habit. We just kind of check the box. We show up. We do what we do. We leave and we're good for another week. But this is an opportunity for us as a family and as individuals to literally meet the living God. Even in our own little chair, our own little space, though we're surrounded by people we know and love, this is our opportunity to come in worship. And to push aside the distractions of the world and the distractions that would keep us from paying attention and focus on him. And uh, and I thank you for allowing me to be the, the weekly encourager from God's word. We have been talking about preparing for the rapture. We've been using the craziness of the world and in the Middle East and in Ukraine and Russia and China and Taiwan and all the other places where we see what little sanity we thought was there slipping away. We see more and more evidence at home. We see more and more evidence around the world. And, and though we don't know that that means the Lord is coming tomorrow, he, he told us, just be watching. I'm going to come when you're not expecting me. So pay attention. Watch the signs. Don't jump to conclusions right? Don't sell your house and go sit on the top of a mountain somewhere, but be ready because I'm coming. And so instead of trying to focus on when that's going to be, since he's already told us, I'm not telling you when it's going to be, um, what we're trying to focus on is preparing 
for that event and getting ready and using all the time that we have between now and then to do what he's called us to do. That's what we're gathered here this morning for. And so we've asked a lot of questions about how can we be sure that we are ready? How can we be sure we know enough to be able to answer questions? And and, and for me, really, the one that kind of keeps haunting me is how can I be sure that I will have the right answer for my kids and my grandkids when it seems like everybody else is making a different choice, when everybody else is, is signing up for a different program? When even some of maybe the pastors and and teachers that I've listened to all over the years begin to say things that I don't think kind of square with scripture. How will I know and not follow them, but be sure that I follow the Lord? And so that's that's where we've been and that's where we're going to continue this morning. I'd also just like to encourage you. Um, I know this is a delicate subject, and this is one that, that maybe will make the hair on the back of your neck stand up. Um, but we are in an important year as far as our nation goes. Um, if you're like me, I'm, I'm not at all happy with the direction of the system in which our government and our country is run. Um, but I have to remind myself that this is the system that God has given me to function within. And it's really easy for me just to say, you know what, it's all going down the toilet anyway, so it doesn't really make any difference what I do or what I say or who I talk to. But the truth is that as long as we have opportunity, we need to be careful that we're doing all that we can to make a difference, to impact this system however we can. There's, there's maybe not a whole lot we can do, but what we can do, we need to be sure to do. I, I'm, I'm always just amazed at the end of an election cycle when the statistics come out, if they can be trusted, that reveal something like such a small fraction of Christians even voted that if they had voted, it would have made a huge difference in the outcome of the election. And I know If you're like me, you're not happy with the choices that we're going to be left with. But please don't let that keep you from standing up for what's right and voicing what's right. I I know that it generally ends up in a fight with whoever it is you're trying to talk to. And that's not really what the Lord is after either. But I believe it's our, our privilege, our duty to stand up for righteousness And to lovingly and gently and compassionately and kindly just stand up for what's for what's right and what's true. If you can stand up even to sign a petition for the unborn. um, And I know maybe some of you just say, well, I don't sign petitions. I just don't do that. And I get that. At least in some ways I get that. But please understand that the day is coming when you will not have that opportunity. The day is coming when you will not have the opportunity to vote. Those days will most likely be part of our future end times. But while you still have the opportunity, unless God has has given you convictions against it, I'm not going to get between you and God on this. Please speak for those who can't speak. And let's together as a community, again, let's be careful that we're doing all that we can within this corrupted, difficult system that is upon us. I mean, Paul gave some pretty straight instructions to how they needed to submit to Rome. And the Roman government was anything, anything, you know, that, you could describe as being not fair, not righteous, not any of that. And yet Paul said, you know, Lord's instruction, just just submit to the powers that are there, but do what you can to change what you can change. And that's probably the last thing I'll say, at least until the middle of the summer, okay? Let's pray. Lord, this is a hard time for us to be alive and to know what it is that you want us to do in so many different situations. 
we know that it grieves your heart when our country slaughters the innocent in the womb. And they, and they parade it as a woman's right. Father, we know that it breaks your heart because you love the little children. And the only good part about it is that you are in the process of peopling heaven with this vast number of children who, who may be in heaven. We'll get to watch grow up and we'll get to interact with them as they do. I, I don't know, but Lord, I know how it grieves your heart. This is not what you are about, and this is not what we as believers are, are about. And so I just ask that you would give us wisdom in how we interact with this culture in which we live. I know it's easier sometimes not to say anything or do anything, but Lord, give us wisdom that we could speak in a manner which would engage the adversaries and those that are are on a bandwagon and they are going full steam ahead and maybe some of them haven't even really thought through the ramifications of their decisions. Just help us, Lord, to know what to say, when to say, how to say, and use it because this is our desire to begin a conversation that will enable us to show the love of Jesus, the compassion of Christ, and the plan of salvation to those who don't know it. We also ask that you would continue to work in our hearts, even as relation, in relationship to your word. Lord, forgive us for the way that we sometimes treat it so lightly as if it's not that big a deal. We don't take advantage of the time to immerse ourselves in it, to claim its promises and to allow it to change us the way that you've promised that it will. So this morning, we again ask, would you speak to our hearts? Would you challenge us? Would you draw us nearer to you that we might sense your presence and we might sense what it is that we are missing out on when we do ignore your word? Thank you for your unconditional love. Thank you for your immeasurable patience with us. Please have your way in our hearts this morning and give us hearts to respond to your spirit, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you've been with us the last few weeks, you'll know that we just finished up Psalm 1 and in kind of response to all of those questions, I presented to you the very stark statement that maybe of all the things that you and I need to do in order to prepare for the end times that are coming and they're here and are getting more and more difficult is we need to be people of the word. We need to be people who delight in God's word. And we saw that in that first Psalm. And again, these promises to the one who's accepted Christ as their savior, to the one that's been born again, the psalmist describes as that person delighting in the law of the Lord meditating on that law day and night. And in response to those actions, the psalmist says he will be like a tree planted by the streams of water that yields its fruit in its season. Its leaf also does not wither. And all that he does, he prospers. And he concludes with, for the Lord is knowing the way of the righteous. And there's not a one of us here that doesn't want to be like that, a steady, stable, sturdy tree that the winds of time cannot do any damage to. A tree that your family can gather around and, if necessary, huddle under the protection of the branches. You and I want to be that person that our family knows. We can go to him because he, he's always got the answer. He always reminds us of what for, we're forgetting. Or maybe tells us what we don't know. Or shares with us what he's seeing that we haven't seen. We want to be that. We would love to be a person that's described as fruitful. You know, unchanging. And maybe most of all, prospering in all that we do. Wouldn't that be amazing? Well, the answer's here. 
And yet this morning, in addition to all of the things that God promises in his word that he will use his word to accomplish, there's a second part to that. Because I know that for at least maybe some of you, you're saying, well, you know what, I've been reading God's word for a long time, and I don't feel any different. I don't feel like this person you're describing. Uh, I don't feel like everything I'm doing is prospering. I don't feel like I have all the answers. I don't feel like I know what's going on. I don't feel like anybody in my family is turning to me. You know, they're going to the internet. They're, they're asking somebody else. They're asking their friends. They're, they're not asking me. So, so what is it that I'm missing? And you begin to think things like, well, you know, maybe I'm not reading it the right way. Maybe I'm not reading the right translation. But oftentimes we come to the place where we start believing the lie and we start saying things like, you know what, it's... Maybe just that this promise really isn't for me. It's, it's a promise that God offers, but it just doesn't work for me. So I'm going to kind of ever, I'm going to give up ever expecting to really see a change and to really see these promises coming to pass in my life. Well, if that's, in any way, at least a thought that's kind of passed your mind on occasion, or if it's exactly where you're living right now, I want you to know that there's another component to the living, active, sharper than any sword word of God that we've been talking about. You see, we, we can get to this place of habitual reading and the emphasis is on habitual without really any application, without any interaction with the author. Sometimes we, we approach the word of God as a book. We read words. We check the box. Maybe not even intentionally, but it's, it's, it's part of the routine. I need to read God's word, so I'll read God's word. And it's more of a habit than it is meaningful. We don't come expecting to really learn anything, so we don't really leave ever really learning anything. And we just assume that we're the problem and maybe it'll change, but if not, at least we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. You, you know, it's, it's just the thought that, um, that I've kind of been messing around with in my mind this week. But have you ever noticed in the Gospels that you never really see Jesus off by himself pouring over the scrolls, reading God's word, studying? Did it ever occur to you that the Lord never really told his disciples, man, you guys need to read more. You, you, you need to study the scriptures more. I mean, really the only time that at least I can remember that Jesus read the scrolls was when he was in the synagogue, right, on a Sabbath morning. And he didn't read a very long passage. And he rolled it up and he set it down and he said about one sentence and, and, and everything broke loose, right? He just simply said, well, you know what? Today, this scripture's fulfilled in your ears. And they paraded him out to the side of the hill there in Nazareth where they were going to kill him for blasphemy. The emphasis that we see in the life of Jesus was never on the law. Now, we're going to assume that Jesus had delighted in the law of the Lord for the first 30 years of his life, right? In preparation for what he came to do. If you go through Old Testament passages and, and you kind of follow this trail, there's this indication, there's this evidence that the Spirit of God, you know, was teaching Jesus during those formative years. And yes, he probably was a part of, of, the, of the Jewish school. Yes, he probably memorized big portions of the Old Testament. It's all part of his training. We see it reflected in the temptation where he repeatedly quotes scripture to Satan to answer his temptations. And he gave us a model of the purpose and the power of the word of God to combat sin. But once he began his ministry, do you notice what the emphasis was on in Jesus' life? 
What was he always off by himself doing? Praying. And if you've been watching The Chosen, and, and even if you uh, went to the theaters to see this last season, you've noticed that over and over and over again, when they portray the disciples praying, it's, 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 it's a memorized quotation of a psalm, which is beautiful, and I love it. And I think, man, it's so awesome that, that they, they sit down and before they eat, they, they quote a psalm, if you will, about praising the God who, who gives, you know, um, bread to the, to the eater and seed to the sower and, and all the different things. But it was a memorized, wrote, this is what we do before we eat. I'm not criticizing that, but it's just what they did. Prayer is, is supposed to be so much more than that. And when we get to Luke chapter 11, I'd love to invite you to join me there. Luke chapter 11, I want you to see how Jesus takes advantage of this situation um, to try to teach his disciples what prayer really is. And I think as we go on, maybe, maybe it will come back and tie into what we talked about at the very beginning. But in 11, uh, Luke 11, Jesus was praying in a certain place. And in this particular instance, he was not alone. The disciples were close enough to at least observe him, maybe even to hear him. And when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. So again, there's a pattern here where the leader teaches the students how to do a discipline, how to, in this case, pray. And, and so Jesus says, okay, I'll teach you how to pray. And he gives us what we call the Lord's Prayer. It's not really the Lord's Prayer, but that's what we call it. And if you've ever read, especially Matthew's account, it's a little bit longer, a little bit fuller. It's beautiful. In fact, I can remember in college, Every day in chapel, we would recite this together. And, and you know, and, and it was, again, it was a beautiful thing. We're, we're quoting the word of God. We're quoting the very words of Jesus. But it wasn't really a prayer. Because if you've noticed, when you do something over and over and over again, enough times in a row, you generally stop thinking about what you're doing, Right? And thinking about what you're saying. And I could, by the end of my four years in college, I could get from the beginning of that to the end of that. And I could say it word perfect. And I could never even consciously think about one word that I said. That's not a compliment, by the way. That's, that's, a, you know, that's just human nature. That's never been God's intention of what prayer should be. And in every other place in scripture, let's just take the uh, Garden of Gethsemane situation where we see Jesus again praying and we get to hear what he's praying. Do you notice how he didn't quote the Lord's Prayer? Did you notice how he didn't quote some psalm, some passage only? I'm sure there were times when he brought in scripture to his prayers, but what were his prayers? They were a communication with his father <laughs> him talking with his father in fact all the different times when he even said to his disciples um, you guys go ahead um, I need to I need to go pray the impression was never uh, it's it's one o'clock it's prayer time so um, I need to go recite my prayers you guys go ahead the impression that we're left with is always in Scripture. Jesus saying, I, I need to talk to Abba. I need to talk to Daddy. There's things I need to tell him. There's things I need to ask him about. There's things I, I need help with. I need direction with. I, I, I need interaction, right? I need interaction. Well, these first four verses, Jesus just gives them kind of a model. You could pray something like this. Um, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Not necessarily those exact words, but what you need to do when you come to prayer is you need to first and foremost recognize and confess 
that Jesus Christ, Father, that we're praying to, at least in this setting, that, the, that God Almighty, omnipotent, is holy. He's righteous. He's separate, hollow, that he's, he's set apart from all the mundane things around us. Understand that you're entering into his presence the infinitely sinless, holy God, and you are infinitely everything the opposite. And so we come on our knees and we come in surrender and we come in submission and we come by the blood of Jesus Christ. But it's a big deal as we enter into his presence, if you will, in a special way. And once Jesus went back to heaven and sent the Holy Spirit, in a sense, the Holy Spirit, God, is with us all the time. But in our prayer, we, we intentionally push everything aside and we enter into a quiet prayer bubble with just him. That's why he always kept saying, when you do that, do it alone, right? Unless this is corporate prayer we're talking about, get alone and talk to your father. And then pray that, um, that your plan for this world, your kingdom is, is moving in the right direction. Pray that God will accomplish his will. Man, we got to pray for that for our nation. Lord, our nation is a mess and the world is a mess. And I don't know if there is yet time in your plan for another revival to sweep this nation and turn them back to you. If there's time in your plan, then, Lord, please make it happen. If there's not, then prepare us for what's to come. But again, praying in submission to the Father's will. It's okay in verse 3 to ask for your needs to be met. Lord, I need food. You know, I need gas for the car. I need heat for the house. I need shoes for the kids. It's okay to ask for what we need because our Father delights to give us what we need. And then encouragement to ask forgiveness for our sins. In the same way that we've been told, we're supposed to forgive everyone who has sinned against us. And to thank the Lord for the forgiveness that we find in Jesus. Right? And then lead us not into temptation. And Matthew goes on and added a few more phrases. But this was a model. This was just an example when you pray, guys, you can pray something like this. These are, the, these are the areas that you can try to incorporate into your prayer. But talk to God, right? Talk to God. I, I, silly illustration, but maybe it will help. I'm thinking of a young couple falls in love. They get married, begin to start a family, and the, and the husband is suddenly called away to active duty. And before that child conceived in love of a husband and wife had the chance to be born, he was was removed. He was off to another continent. But he began to write letters to this child. You know, son or daughter, you you put in whichever one you want. And he writes letters. And, And his faithful wife reads those letters to that child while she's nursing, while she's rocking, As that child grows up, she just continues to read those letters. And in those letters, the husband is telling his child, I love you. Can't wait to be with you. Here are my hopes. Here are my dreams. Here are my plans. And they include you. And they'll happen one day. And I'm sorry I have to be away from you right now because I would so much rather be with you. But it is what... It's supposed to be, and until that time comes, just be assured that I love you, and I'm thinking of you, and I can't wait to be with you. And the child grows, and the child begins to better understand the heart of her father and the words that he's sharing. And and when that child is old enough to begin to write, that child begins to answer those letters. I love you too, Daddy. I can't wait to see you. We're going to have so much fun on the playground and in the bounce house and and to go here and to go there. And, you know, you, you can't help but feel the relationship that's growing and building. All looking forward to the day when those letters will no longer be required. 
and you come to understand those letters were never the end game. That's never the whole goal of life. Because when the father comes back, he's not going to live in another part of town so they can keep writing letters together, right? No, the letters all go, you'd say, to the trash can or, or maybe to that special place where they would save them. But they're never again the focus. Why? Because now there's a face-to-face -face relationship. And that's what this word is. It's special. It's inspired. It is amazing in so many ways. And yet its intention never was that it would become the most important thing in eternity. I mean, I can't find anywhere in Scripture once, where once we get to heaven, we are going to have Bible studies. I, I just can't. Now, maybe, maybe there's some part of this. I mean, I would love to sit in and have God explain some of this to me. That would be amazing. But I have a funny feeling when the choice is this or Jesus' face right here. Maybe we'll just set this aside and we'll just talk about everything he wants me to know. And so prayer is the way we respond to this book. It's the way that we respond to the love of God shed abroad in our hearts. It's the way that we build the relationship that this book is intended to foster. I mean, a daddy doesn't write letters to his daughter so that she can see how beautiful his handwriting is. He doesn't write them so that she can conjugate the verbs and she can break down the sentences to come to, you know, to really fully understand what that sentence really maybe meant in the original language. The daddy writes the letters to his daughter so that she will know how much he loves her, how much he misses her, how much he can't wait to be with her. And that's what this book communicates to you and to me. And if we never respond to the author in prayer, if we never give him a chance through the Spirit to help us to understand what he's really saying, then we're missing this huge component of the intention of delighting ourselves in the law of the Lord. It's also what makes it not turn into habit only. When we're reading and then going to the Lord and saying, help me to understand, what, what is it that I'm missing? And you know this because you've experienced this, and I've experienced it. The Spirit of God moves us and begins to put ideas in our head that apply, and they make application of what we just read to a certain situation which oftentimes requires our response to, our actions in response to what it is the Spirit's telling us. And we see all over again why this book is living. It's because through this book, God is, is literally directing our steps to do things in obedience to this book. And that's how he changes us, and that's how he grows us. And that's how he renews us. But it's easy for us at times, if we're not careful, to read, to close the book, to get up, to walk away without ever giving the author the chance to say, okay, now let's talk about what you just read. And I see that so beautifully explained in a simple story that Jesus tells right on the heels of this, so they are connected and it's almost as if he says to the disciples, okay, here's, here's model prayer. You know, you've got four different components, whatever it is that you should try to incorporate in your prayer. But let me tell you a story to explain that whole prayer thing. And he says this in verse five, which of you has a friend who will go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend, lend me three loaves for a friend of mine has arrived on a journey and I have nothing to set before him. 
Okay, pick a friend, any friend. Don't say their name out loud, but you have a friend that that you know and you trust them and they trust you. Midnight, you pick up the phone and you call him or her, right? There's probably not a lot of people that you would do that to. Most of you would probably never call me at midnight unless it was a real emergency. And even then, you'd probably call somebody else first. But you have people in your circle of friends that you would call at midnight. Why? Because they're your friend and you know that they're not going to yell at you. They're not going to say, what are you doing? Do you not know what time it is? They're going to say, what can I do? And so Jesus lays it out. And from within, this friend says, don't bother me. Are you crazy? I finally got the baby to sleep. If I open the door, the whole household's going to be awakened and I'm not going there. Go ask somebody else, right? So I don't know how much of a friend that person really was, but as part of this analogy, Jesus is making this point. You have a friend that you dare go to at midnight and your friendship is not even strong enough to get this person to get out of bed and give you what you need. Okay, he goes on and he says, I tell you, though he will not get up and give him anything on the basis of his friendship alone, yet because of his impudence, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. Now, I love the word. Usually you see the word persistence, right? Diligence, trying to make it sound not so bad. Impudence is a really offensive word. Um, impudence is, is the kind of word that you, with, you would respond to with, well, how dare you say that? I mean, it's, it's offensive. I mean, literally, it means shamelessness, insolence, audacity. But the one we're really after is boldness. Now, Jesus, Jesus is telling almost a funny story. And you got to see the humor in this. You got a friend. He's got bread. You need bread. You're in a really, you know, you're in a pickle of a situation because your friend showed up without even telling you he's coming. And you have nothing to put before him, which was common in that day. You usually ate all the bread in the house before the night was over. And then tomorrow you'd go buy more bread or you'd bake more bread. But in this situation, Your friendship alone is not enough. Your relationship is not enough for you to get what you need. And so what do you do? You keep pounding on the door until your friend gets so upset at you that he gets out of bed and he throws the loaves at you and says, get out of here and don't ever bother me again. And the humor of that is is that, you know what? You might just have lost a friend, but you got what you needed, right? You, You got the bread that you needed. And then look at how the Lord applies it. Who is he talking about? He's talking about God the Father. And he's saying to his disciples, in a sense, you guys might not feel like that you have enough of a relationship to get anything from God because you're not that close. Have you ever asked and had anybody ask you, hey, would you pray for me? And you say, well, why can't you pray? Well, you know God better than I do. Or he knows you better than he knows me. Or even sometimes more honestly, I'm not really sure he knows my name. I'm not really sure he knows who I am. But obviously he does you. In fact, have you ever noticed that when you pray in the presence of an unsaved person, just friends that uh, maybe you're eating with and you'd say, hey, is it okay if I just thank the Lord for the food and, and you just say a simple blessing? And you will sometimes hear them say something like, you know, when you pray, it sounds like you're talking to somebody. I, I don't get that. You, you talk like you know him or you, you talk like he knows you. Or you talk like he's really listening. Have you ever had that experience? It's, it's beautiful, but to an unbeliever, the very thing they cannot wrap their arms around is salvation means 
a living relationship with the living God. It's the difference between talking to the girl on your very first date, which is as weird as weird can get, right? Awkward, self-conscious about everything. And you remember that. But then you compare that with talking with your wife of 50 years. The difference. It's all in relationship. But the difference is absolutely amazing. No awkwardness, no fear, no worry. You can say whatever you want to say to that person. And they know you so well and they love you so much that even if what you said was the stupidest thing they've ever heard in their life, they will translate it because of their love for you. Oh, this is probably what he really meant. Either that or he's losing his mind and I really don't want to go there right now. So let's just you know, give him the benefit of the doubt. Unsafe people don't understand this relationship With God? You know God? He knows you? You can talk to him? Does he answer? These are the kind of questions that that unsafe people don't get. But Jesus is trying to help his disciples to understand. When you pray, you got to remember you're praying not to an angry, impersonal upset, interrupted force who's going to respond. What do you want? What do you want now? It's not that way. He said, you're going to someone who even if you don't feel like you have a good enough relationship with to get anything from, let me tell you. Let me tell you, if you keep on Pounding on the door. (laughs) He'll give you what you're asking for if it's in harmony with his will for your life and what's best for you. And he goes on to, to give those beautiful words that you've all memorized. And so I tell you, keep on asking and it will be given to you. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and it will be open to you. For everyone who keeps on asking will receive, and the one who keeps on seeking will find, and to the one who keeps on knocking it will be opened. So many times the problem is that he's not listening, that he doesn't care, that he doesn't know what to say. The problem is you stopped asking a long time ago. He loves to hear your voice. He loves to hear you come to him and say, Daddy, I need help. I can't do this on my own. I've got a situation going on here. I, I need help. So, Daddy, I'm coming to you for help. And I'm not going to stop coming until you help me. I want to spend more time with this Lord willing, next week, but so many of us share as a common bond, a common burden. We have children or grandchildren or close family members, loved ones who don't know Jesus or who have decided they don't know Jesus anymore or who have decided they're not sure if they know Jesus, but they're not really interested in talking about it right now. And we carry this burden. And sometimes it's like, well, Lord, you know what? either you chose them or you didn't, so you're going to do what you're going to do, so I'm just going to kind of give you this request and you just file it wherever you just whatever. No, 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 no. He wants us every single day to come to him and say, Daddy, now my, my son so-and-so, my daughter so-and-so, my grandkid so-and-so, I don't know where they are with you right now. But I still want them to be in heaven. Would you please, today, would you, would you work in their hearts? We're going to talk about different ways to pray more specifically than just bless them or whatever. But the emphasis for today is in the 
boldness, the impudence, if you will, the insolence, if you will, that we would dare to pound on the door of God Almighty every single day until he hears us. And if you want to follow the story, gets out of bed and gives us what we want. And there's the humor in there. God's never in bed. God's never too busy. God never doesn't care enough. God never says, go away, you're bothering me. But that's the way Jesus is portraying him. And then he goes on and he just says, well, what father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a snake? Daddy, I'm hungry. Can I have a fish? <laughs> Here's a snake. See how, that, see how that works out for you, kid. There's a, there's a, 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 oh, just a harsh, wicked, mocking tone to that. Your father will never, ever, ever, ever do anything like that for you. He will never chide you. He will never sport, uh, spurn you. He will never scorn you. He'll never laugh at you when you come to him with a request. I don't care what it is. He will never do that. Or back to the father again. If, um, if he asks for an egg, if, if your son asks you for an egg, will you give him a scorpion? No. Here's then the punchline. If you then, who are evil, you're, you're fallen, you're broken, you have, a, you have a, a wicked heart, you're human. It doesn't mean that you are an evil person. It just means you're born in sin and you are, you are a fallen creature. You're not sinless and you're not perfect. If you in that condition know how to give good gifts to your children... A fish, an egg, sustenance, food, clothes, and even beyond that, you know how to give gifts that make the eyes of your children light up. You have some of those images filed carefully in your memory banks. Christmases, birthday parties, special events, vacations together. We live to pull those out and replay them, right? To see the eyes of our children. Even sometimes, you know, Marlene and I will joke about, well, let's go to Disney World and let's, you know, let's, let's go back to the happiest place on earth. When we lived in California, we had a season pass and we could go there whenever we wanted to. And usually the end of the discussion is, yeah, sure, we can do that, but why don't we wait until we have the grandkids with us? Why? It's because the size of their eyes and the smile on their face beats Mickey Mouse every time. This is your father. He will gladly, willingly, joyfully, happily do so much more than your earthly father could ever do. If you who are human even in your human condition, know how to give good gifts to your children. And here it is. How much more will the heavenly father give, in Matthew's account, give good things to them that ask him? And the comparison is just with your earthly father. Your heavenly father will give you so much more and so much better gifts than your earthly father could ever give you. Why? Because he loves you so much more. Because he has so much more at his disposal. Because he knows exactly what you need and exactly what will help you. But in this passage, he said, how much more will the heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? And it's like, well, wait, wait. we didn't ask for the Holy Spirit. We asked for gifts, right? We, we asked for, no, no, no. You got to understand. When God says, Whatever you need, I can give to you. Instead of just giving you what you need, he gives you the source of all that you need. In fact, MacArthur in his commentary puts it this way. To those who ask for a gift, he gives the giver. To those who ask for an effect, he gives the cause. 
To those who ask for a product, he gives the source. To those seeking comfort, he gives the comforter. To those seeking power, he gives the source of power. To those seeking help, he gives the helper. To those seeking truth, he gives the spirit of truth. To those seeking love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, he gives the producer of all of those things. The indwelling Holy Spirit is the source of every good thing in the Christian's life. It's as if you would ask Jesus, could I have a hug? I I need a hug right now. And he says, how about I just come live with you for all of eternity and I'll hug you whenever you need a hug. That's, That's the comparison. Part of the reason why the word of God doesn't have the the effect on us and the place in us that God intends it to is because so often we shut out the author from speaking to us about what it is we just read. The challenge for us today is, yes, please continue to delight yourself in the law of God. Yes, Get on a Bible reading schedule. Yes, be intentional. Yes, be diligent. Yes, be faithful. Yes, if you can, make it happen early enough in the day that you still have some brain cells available, right? If you are a mother and you have many small children around you, beg your husband to give you, please, a half an hour, 15 minutes, 30 seconds, whatever, somewhere in a quiet place where you can get alone with your God. And husbands, please, please be sensitive to that. We have women who, in some cases, are starving for God's word in quiet interaction with their God for 10 years while they're raising children who make sure that none of them are all asleep at the same time, right? We all need that time. And when we take the time, please remember you're not coming to a God that's going to say, what do you want? Oh, you again? You're coming to a God who says, I, I want to give you so badly what you're asking for. How about if I give you more? How about if I give you better? How about if I just ask you to wait a little bit longer so that when I do give it to you, you'll be so much more prepared for it so much more appreciative of it. Friends, our God loves us so much. He delights to answer our prayers. But sometimes I fear that we have stopped asking because we're either too busy or too preoccupied or we've decided that this whole relationship thing that PJ keeps talking about isn't really for me. And it is for you. If the Spirit of God is in your heart, he is waiting for you to say, okay, author, what was that one all about? And let's talk about it. Try it, challenge him. Invite him into the mix, see what he does And you will be amazed as I always am. Every week when I get around to doing that, he's sitting there waiting patiently for me to show up. And it's almost as if he says, you have a question? You have something you need for me to answer? Let's talk about it. How much more will your... Heavenly Father, give you the Holy Spirit if you'll just ask. Lord, we're grateful 
for the love that you reveal to us in your word. We're so grateful for your work, but we're just as grateful for the Holy Spirit who ministers that word to us. Give us the resolve that we're going to put you to the test in this, that we're going to find out whether this applies to us or not. May every single person here that has the ability decide in their heart, purpose in their heart, that this is going to be their practice moving forward. Not just reading your word, but being still and being silent and talking with you and giving you the chance to respond. Help us, Lord, to be those people who come to know you intimately because we're willing to respond to the love that you've shed abroad in our hearts. So take us from this place and carry us to where you want us to be and teach us and instruct us and encourage us and bless us as we surrender to your word, to your spirit, And we ask, Lord, that you would show us what relationship with you really looks like. Be with our dear family members here as they go home out into the snow and the cold. And we ask for safety on the road as many of them will be returning to their homes outside of town. We pray that you would bless them, that you would give them safety, that you would continue to minister to them. And for those that are carrying special burdens today, we pray, Lord, that they would find you ready and willing to answer the prayers of their heart as they wait on you. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Once again, thank you so much for being here this morning. God bless you as you go. You're dismissed.